A few months ago we made a video which we hope will give you a good baseline setting for your suspension. Now in this video what we wanted to do is follow up on that uh, and give you some tips on how you can fine tune your suspension setup to your specific style of riding. So it's a good idea to watch that video first because then this video will make a lot more sense. You can find the link to that down in the video description. Suspension setup is all about balancing support against suppleness. So on the one hand, you don't want your suspension to dive or wallow too much when you're hitting corners or braking hard. But on the other hand, you want the suspension to be as comfortable as possible and track the ground as, as well as it possibly can to give you the maximum amount of traction, which basically means keeping the tires in contact with the ground as consistently as possible as they go over rough and undulating terrain. And that's actually a really hard balance to strike because on the one hand you need your suspension to be firm enough that it doesn't bottom out or wallow too easily and on the other hand it needs to be soft enough that it gives you enough compliance and traction and comfort. But your suspension may have three or sometimes four different ways of fine-tuning that balance, each of which will have a, a different effect on the way it deals with bumps and the way it gives you support. These methods of adjustment are the spring rate, which is related to the sag, the progression, which is to do with the, the number of volume spaces fitted to your air suspension, the low speed compression damping, and finally the high speed compression damping, which some high end shocks and forks will also have. So depending on where you find your suspension lacking support, or where you're finding it too harsh, that will determine which of these parameters you want to adjust and in what direction. So starting off with the most basic of these, which is the spring rate. So in that how to get your suspension dialed in 10 minutes video, we showed you how to measure your sag, because that's a really good way of getting your spring rate in the right ballpark for your weight. So we suggested 30% sag for the rear shock, which I think for most bikes is a really good starting point. However, as you get more into fine tuning your suspension setup, you might find that's either too soft or too harsh for your riding style. If you find that your bike is wallowing too much or sitting too low in its travel, the first thing you might want to try is increasing the spring rate by increasing the pressure in the air spring to give you less sag, maybe 25% instead of 30%. That will make the bike sit higher in its travel and give you a kind of slightly firmer ride. We also showed you a method of measuring the sag on the fork, but measuring sag on forks is a lot harder and a lot more unreliable than it is with rear shocks. It's much better to go off the pressure that may be printed on the uh, air side of your fork as a starting point. And if you find it's diving too easily or it's too harsh over small bumps, the primary point of adjustment is always the spring rate. So if you're having trouble with your fork feeling too soft or too harsh, don't worry too much about measuring the sag again. Just make a note of what pressure it's at and adjust it by maybe five PSI up or down and then go for a ride again and see how that feels. For example, in my fork at the moment, I know that I'll be running about 96 PSI, maybe slightly harder on really steep terrain, but I actually have no idea how much sag I'm running on that fork. The pressure is a much more accurate and reliable means of determining the correct spring rate for you. The way I like to think about it, sag is just the starting point but as you get into fine-tuning the suspension, you really want to be thinking about the pressure. The next thing you might want to look at is the progression of your suspension. Basically how much the spring force ramps up towards the end of the travel. This is adjusted through things called volume spaces, which basically clip into the fork of the shock, adjusting the volume of the air canister. And that affects how much the air pressure, and therefore the spring rate, increases as you get towards the end of the travel. So this means that you can adjust your spring rate and kind of sag off the top sensitivity independently of bottom out force. If you think that your sag and your spring rate are about right so that it doesn't feel too soft under normal riding but then when you hit something hard like a drop off or land a jump it bottoms out then you may want to add volume spaces just to give it a bit more bottom out resistance in the final portion of the travel. That doesn't necessarily mean that you should be bottoming out on every single ride. What it means is when you hit an obstacle or a feature that where you feel it's appropriate for your bike to use full travel, it should be using full travel. So the purpose of volume spaces is to allow you to have plenty of bottom out resistance um, and ramp up towards the kind of final third of the travel without having to go with such a firm spring rate that the initial part of the travel is firmer than you would like. So you can kind of tune them independently. 
Now, because volume spaces only really affect the final kind of third of the travel significantly, you may still find that your suspension is pushing too easily through the middle third of the travel, particularly in corners, G-outs, or when pushing into the face of a jump. In this case, it can also be useful to adjust the low-speed compression damping, which a lot of mid to high-end forks and also some high-end shocks have. This is usually a blue dial that you can adjust clockwise to make it firmer or anti-clockwise to make it softer. Now I'd recommend that most people start with this set fully anti-clockwise to make the suspension as supple as possible. In simple terms, low speed compression affects how easy it is for the suspension to compress at low shaft speeds. It's got nothing to do with how fast you're moving along the trail, it's all to do with how quickly the suspension itself is moving. So low shaft speeds are typically associated with things like pedaling, rider movements, or hitting kind of gradual compressions like corners or jump faces. So low speed compression damping can help to resist the compression of the suspension in those situations where you don't want the suspension to compress, helping to preserve its dynamic geometry. On the other hand, small bumps like roots and small rocks and what have you, won't have enough time to get the suspension moving very fast. So these will also be affected by the low speed compression. So winding on more low speed compression will have a significant effect on how comfortable the suspension is over small bumps in particular. Whereas if you hit something hard, like if you're landing a big drop or you hit a really big bump, that will generally move the suspension fast enough that it will open the high speed compression circuit, which we'll get onto later. So adding lots of low speed compression won't actually make it significantly harder to bottom out your suspension. You can try this by winding on all the low speed compression or even putting the lockout on your shock or fork on. And then doing the test that we showed you in the previous video where you push down the suspension explosively as hard as you can. And you'll find you'll be able to use almost as much travel with a low speed compression wound fully on than wound fully off. That's because on big impacts, most of the oil flow will go through the high speed compression circuit. So you won't actually affect that much how the suspension deals with big hits, but you will significantly affect how sensitive the suspension is, small bumps like roots and small stones, etc. With all that in mind, what I would normally recommend and how I would normally set up my suspension is to start with the low speed compression fully off, fully anti-clockwise to give you the maximum suppleness over small bumps and what have you. Then if you find that your fork is diving too easily, then you might want to add some low speed compression to the fork because you can do that quite easily on the trail. But if you find yourself having to wind on lots of low speed compression, that will really significantly affect the sensitivity and comfort of your fork. In that case, you might want to go back and look at whether you've got the right spring rate. Because if you can get the support from the spring rather than the damper, that will give you an overall more sensitive and more predictably supportive setup. Because while low speed compression will help slow down how quickly the fork dives, it won't stop it diving completely. Similarly, if you're finding that your bike is squatting backwards in corners and the rear is compressing much more than the front, you may be able to compensate for that by adding some low speed compression to the rear shock because that will help hold your bike up a little bit longer and keep the bike more level in the corners. But once again, it may be worth going back and looking at your spring pressures as well if you're doing that too much. So the take home message is that low speed compression is a really handy way of fine tuning the level of support you have, both front and rear, under slower compression such as corners and braking and what have you. But it won't significantly affect how easy it is for your suspension to bottom out and it will have a really detrimental effect on how sensitive your suspension is over small bumps. This is where we come on to high speed compression damping which as the name suggests, pertains to higher shaft velocities. So this is things like hitting larger bumps, particularly at speed, and also landing drops, jumps, what have you. Now the truth is that high speed compression will also affect things at lower shaft velocities. In the same way that low speed compression will have some effect at higher shaft velocities. There's a lot of overlap between the two, but generally speaking, High speed compression as opposed to low speed compression will have less of an effect over smaller bumps but will have more of an effect on those big jarring hits. High speed compression adjustment is something you'll find on the highest end forks and shocks. 
In very basic terms, what these high-end dampers allow you to do is adjust how easily that high-speed valving opens up when you hit a large impact. One thing that high-speed compression damping affects is how easy it is for your fork or shock to use full travel, which is why it's not actually that common to see high-speed compression adjustment, especially on an air spring where you can use volume spacers to prevent bottom out as well. However, high-speed compression damping will also have quite a significant effect on how much travel you use on individual bumps, even if those bumps aren't big enough to use full travel. So high-speed compression damping can be used to affect your dynamic ride height, i.e. how far your suspension sits into its travel as you go through consecutive bumps. Now this is also affected by rebound speed, but basically compression damping is always a lot lighter than rebound damping. So as you hit multiple bumps, the fork generally sends to, tends to pack down into its travel because compression is much easier than rebound for it. So by adding high speed compression in particular, you will use less travel, particularly on the larger bumps, and so you will sit higher in your travel as you go through kind of really gnarly rock gardens. Low speed compression is very useful for making your bike feel more stable, especially under rider impacts like pedaling and moving about, whereas high speed compression will affect how much travel you use under large impacts. This is why downhill riders who want to have really good sensitivity, but also have a bike which doesn't use too much travel as they hit really big gnarly rock gardens at high speed, will tend to use fairly light low speed compression setting, but a very firm high speed compression setting. And this is known as a progressive damping setup. Whereas if you're out trail riding and you want a bike that's pedal efficient and that won't move too much as you shift your weight through corners, but at the same time when you hit bumps you want to be able to absorb as much of that bump as possible, you would have the opposite and that's called a digressive or even regressive damping setup which means lots of low speed to keep the bike stable and pedal efficient, but not too much high speed so that when you hit a big bump it still uses lots of travel and gives you a, a relatively comfortable ride. So those are kind of the two opposing schools of thought on compression damping setup. And what works best for you will depend on a lot of factors including your bike and your riding style and what you hope to get out of your suspension setup. When you are fine-tuning your level of support to suit your riding style, I would recommend going through these four steps, starting with spring rate, then volume spaces, then low speed compression, and then finally, if you have it, high speed compression too. And so by fine-tuning those four parameters in that order, you should be able to find the best balance of comfort and compliance. If you're still with us, we've got one last thing to talk about, which is equally important, and that's your rebound damping. In the previous video, we gave you a good method of getting a good baseline with your rebound damping, and I really strongly recommend you doing that if you haven't already. Now, this should give you a rebound setting which works really quite well most of the time, but it still could pay to play about with it a little bit. So your ideal rebound setting will actually depend more than anything on the type of terrain that you ride, and more specifically, the frequency of bumps that you tend to encounter. If you're riding bike park style terrain, where there's a lot of big jumps and big landings, you might want a slower rebound setting, such that your bike is more stable, especially when hitting the lips of jumps. It's less likely to buck you, but on the other hand, it might be less sensitive over high frequency bumps. Now, if you're riding natural, kind of rocky terrain, lots of high frequency chattery bumps, then you might want to run it a little bit faster, such that it tracks the ground slightly faster and doesn't pack down as much on those high frequency hits. Now even if it doesn't feel like your suspension is really obviously packing down over high speed hits, because your rebound damping is always going to be significantly firmer than your compression damping, it will always pack down just a little bit, even if it's not enough to notice. So having a slightly faster rebound will generally get you a more sensitive and comfortable suspension action over those small repeated high speed hits. To conclude then, Slowing down your rebound damping will make the bike feel more stable and calm over well spaced out individual hits and when hitting jumps. However, speeding up the rebound will basically make the suspension more sensitive and transfer less vibration to your hands and to your body when you're hitting high frequency bumps. While those other four adjustments that we talked about balance support against harshness, 
Rebound speed is about balancing high frequency sensitivity against big impact predictability. And it's really important to get the rebound speed correct because that affects comfort just as much as those other four parameters do. Some very high-end shocks have independent low and high speed rebound damping. And I think this is something that confuses people a lot. The first thing to bear in mind is that most shocks only have low speed rebound damping. So just with compression, you want to focus on the low speed first and the high speed after. If you have one of these shocks, the first thing I would do is set it up in exactly the same way as we showed you in the previous video, adjusting the low speed rebound until it oscillates in the car park just right. Just as you would with any other shock where you're only adjusting the low speed rebound. Now the high speed rebound only really opens up when the shock is deep into the travel and where the spring force is higher. That's why rock shocks with their Vivid series shocks talk about beginning stroke and end stroke rebound, when actually what they really mean is low speed and high speed rebound. But beginning stroke and end stroke rebound is actually quite a useful way of thinking about it. So high speed rebound, think of that as your end stroke rebound. So look out for situations where you're using most of the bike's travel, such as where you're landing from a, from a big drop or what have you, and you almost bottom out or bottom out completely, and then the bike rebounds from deep in the travel. If you feel that your rebound is about right earlier in the travel, but when you're landing something hard and using most of the travel, it's kind of bucking too fast or bouncing you off of the landing, then that suggests that your high speed rebound may be too fast and is allowing the suspension to basically rebound too fast from deep in, in the stroke in which case you might want to adjust your high-speed rebound clockwise a few clicks to slow that down. You can test this by finding a drop that you're comfortable with, which uses most or even all of your suspension's travel, and then slow down the high-speed rebound incrementally until you no longer kind of bounce off of that impact. High-speed rebound is about finding the balance of recovering quickly from deep in the travel so that you get back towards the sag point so that the suspension can react again without being so fast as to buck you from harsh landings which use a lot of the travel. In very basic terms, if you're lucky enough to have a shock like this, what it allows you to do or should allow you to do is adjust how the shock reacts to large impacts independently of how it reacts to smaller impacts and earlier in the travel. Now the previous video that we did should give you a setting which I think most people will be pretty happy with. But if you've watched to this point in this video, you're probably wanting a bit more than that. You're probably someone who wants to really get the very most out of the suspension setup. And that does take time. It takes a lot of experimenting with different settings. And the best way to do that is to ride the same piece of trail over and over again, adjusting things as we've described. And that may seem tedious to some people. Personally, I find it really fascinating. But I think it's well worth it in the long run because you can get quite a lot more out of your suspension than you would just by setting it up in the basic way that we showed you previously.